Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Process with Meredith and Dave. Today, we are so fortunate to have fellow Canadian comic book artist, inker, colorist extraordinaire, Francis and Mer writer. And writer. Sorry, and writer. He's the the quadruple threat, Francis Manipool. Thanks for coming on, Francis. No, thank you. I, I appreciate all the hoops because I know it's this has been like a process, actually. So thank you so much for having me. I, well, it's, it's a COVID-19 pandemic. The kids are so all nothing home. Goes, nothing goes well. Right. The kids are all home. So the yeah. last time we tried to do this, we uh, had no internet. And apparently that was kind of countywide. So I'm glad that it worked out today. And uh, you're also dealing with, you know, family and... Impending baby! Impending baby. So, yeah, I'm yeah. really glad that we were able to get this to work out. Well, it's funny. So I'm we're, we're at the triage this morning, right? And... I'm like falling asleep and you know, cause like, you know, Meredith, you've been through this before. So it's like, there's this like doubt where you're like, ah, oh, maybe it's not coming. I feel bad making him wake up. But, but when I was there, you know, as soon as uh, the doctor came in and did all the testing and they said, oh, uh, you can actually go home because, you know, we don't live too far from, from the, from the hospital. So when it comes that we can get there really quickly and, is it bad that my first thought was, oh, well, let me email Meredith and say, I think I can do this. This interview, that was my first thought, right? I'm like, oh, I can email my editors. I'm not I gonna say that's bad. I'm not gonna say that's bad. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, don't get me wrong. I, I like to think that it's just more, I'm, I'm efficient, right? That's right. That's right. You're yeah. constantly, you're like me. I'm, whenever I'm driving anywhere, running errands, I'm like, how can I get, like, I've got five things to do. What's the most efficient yeah. way? And I can do the least amount of driving, spend the least amount of time and get it all done. See, you're just multitasking. You're already exactly. thinking there's another box to check. It's it's like if you're being flung on a slingshot and you're flying over like, I don't know, money or candy, I'm going to stick my hand out and grab as much of it as I can, right? <laughs> that was a great way to put it. I love it. <laughs> I'm using slingshot that analogy <laughs> with my kids from now on. Reach and I'm going to fall asleep on the couch. That's yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm like, I've been awake since 2 a.m. So, and this is my You're first You're delirious. Yeah. You're on your, what, 10th cup of coffee? Almost. <laughs> you you started at Top Cow and you were working on uh, something you had really no time with at all. And how did that lead in to getting more time and, you know, them really respecting you as an artist and, and being willing to trust you on a major book like uh, Witchblade. So how that happened was I knew that that first job that I did for them was for the marketing part of Top Cow and it wasn't really taken seriously to be part of the main Top Cow arena. So what I did was I just kept producing samples, right? So I, at that time I started drawing um, like some Gen 13 samples, some Fantastic Four samples. Um, it was actually, it wasn't Top Cow specific characters. Cause to be perfectly honest, I, I didn't think I suited, um, work there because I, I, I always thought like my, my work always skewed younger. So the place I was actually trying to get into, not so much because I liked it better, but more because I thought I had, um, a higher probability of success was actually a place like Wildstorm. Um, so I was very fortunate enough to get into Top Cow, even though I didn't feel like I fit in. But even though aesthetically um, that was the case, what was kind of great was once I started working there and hanging out with the guys, and that was uh, at a time when when Mark Silvestri would come in and play Halo with us, you know. And it was a strange time because it was also when um, Michael Turner and Frank and those guys had left for Aspen. And, yep. and formed that company, right? So I had like this um, home base of, of two comic companies that one was like formed through initial work and then friendship. And then was one was formed through this weird college like bond because I, I didn't go to, to college university. So being in the, the pit, that's what they called like the bullpen there, right? I think... Dave had a very similar experience because, mm -hmm. like, you basically interned. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. It started as an intern and also no uh, college. I didn't even finish high school. So it really was that for me. And yeah, I think we, we definitely had that in common. It was, you know, 
there were there was tension here and there, but it was a great group of guys, and I miss it, you know, all the time working alone, and I'm sure you must too. Yes and no, right? So when I left Top Cow, uh, I, I did start working more from home again, uh, but then I joined this uh, studio in Toronto called uh, Ray. Um, so I was with them for, geez, a, a long time, maybe 10 years. And last year, uh, me and a couple guys started our own studio in the east end of Toronto. So I'm semi. Yeah, you kept alone. that. Yeah, you mm-hmm. kept that sort of concept of working with a, a group of ours. And you're very fortunate because you live in Toronto. Yeah, it, yeah. It is a hotbed. It is finding people like that versus, I mean, we've got some great talent in Windsor Essex, but it, we're a little more dispersed. Yeah, because you've tried the studio thing and I've it tried. just didn't work out. And I tend to be a bit of a, you know, I like to a hide in my office a yeah. little too much. I've gotten too used to it. I have a question for you because the idea behind this show, the reason we call it process is I think it, it gives people an insight into how people started or the or the things that they looked at in in getting their work going and, and how they do their work. So I'm curious to know when you first started drawing comics, what were some of the the books you looked at? What were some of the ways that you trained yourself prior to getting into Top Cow and, and even that you continued to use when you were working in Top Cow? Like what are the ways that you you pushed yourself to get better? So at the beginning you know, if, I guess if we were to roll back all the way from the start, I, I think I started just like everybody else, which is I, I, I traced Jim Lee comics, right? So all of my old X-Men books are scratched up. There's markers on the margins because I'm trying to match the colors, you know? Um, and I think at that time, the, the image era really, like, it just captured my imagination because these guys were like, they were rock stars, you know? Yeah. And my thing at that time, I was actually really into basketball and you've met me before. I'm not exactly, uh, you're not tall, not a very tall <laughs> individual. You're not, you're, you're not I, I would not say that you, that was one of the gifts God gave yes. you. No, it's not. And, uh, but I saw this, this, I, I feel like I say it every time, but I saw this documentary called hoop dreams. And, and to me, that was more life changing than any comic book because it, it made me realize that, you know, growing up in Scarborough, if I wanted to make my family situation and my situation or our future better, I had to use what I had and figure out how to make a living out of it. Right. So when I went from tracing this stuff, I realized that I, I couldn't develop as an artist by just looking at another artist's work. And I I needed to understand the underpinnings of why Dave drew this or why Jim drew it that way, right? So at that point in time, I I think I bought a bunch of books from Andrew Loomis, uh, Bridgman. Um, you know, there's this one book where it's just all hands, one that was all torso. And it's mind blowing that like, you know, Dave, you're posting videos of that. And sometimes it makes me think, oh my God, you know, like if I were like, 15 years old right now and I had access to these things and I'm sure you think of this as well I mean you don't need to because you're really good but sometimes do you think man if I have access to these things how much better would I have been right so oh yeah and and just how much easier it would have been how much faster it would have been and it's so much heartache that that went into learning so (coughs) yeah having it broken down would be great you know there there there's so many advantages now with the internet Absolutely. But it's, it's interesting because I'm torn with that because often my, my knee jerk reaction is, oh man, I wish I had access to this back then. But a part of me also kind of realizes that I think part of the reason that one of the things I think makes a successful pro comic book artist is the, the endurance part, the enduring of pain and deadlines. (laughs) And I think the, the, the arduous task of getting those books going to the library because I remember going to the library because I didn't have the internet to learn some of these things, looking through magazines and collecting and cutting them out. Right. So, you know, from those instructional books, I started kind of observing more from, from life. So I, I I felt like I was kind of looking at things and go, Oh, that's, that's how that works. Right. 
and ironically, because I, I hate looking at reference. So what I try to do is when I look at things, I try to memorize it. So when you're going into my comic books, you're not looking at the, the street of Toronto. You're looking at the street of Toronto through my eyes. Yeah, you, and you're you, not. You take a visual, like a mental snapshot. And then. Yeah. The page. Yeah. And you're not looking at a car. You're looking at a car that I drew, right? Which inevitably always looks like a Volkswagen Golf or a pickup truck or a TTC bus, right? <laughs> those are, or, or, or an old Nissan Micra. <laughs> I don't know if you guys remember those. But so that was like the developmental stage. And I would say currently and over the last, I would say 10 years, the things that have really interested me more is is storytelling and, 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 and writing because I might be jumping uh, questions here, but I, I felt like in order to get a, become a better penciler, I needed to learn how to ink. And then I realized that once I learned how to color, I was becoming a better penciler and inker because I, I knew what was in the next step. And with the writing aspect, I felt like it was making me a better artist for other writers, right? And I just felt like learning all the disciplines even though I may be a master of none in a jack of all trades, as they say, but it just felt like like learning different disciplines within our medium helped me understand the original medium that I started with. So I'm just going to leave because Francis has got all my questions covered already. I don't even have to ask them. <laughs> I just think the question and Francis answers it because that, that was so, actually going to be my next question. I also so want to make the point that I totally agree with what you say about the fact that People have access to stuff so instantly and so easily nowadays that I think it makes it more challenging for people to be able to just grit through things. I see that in my own kids, mm -hmm. that the, the sense of cognitive dissonance that I'm having to push my kids through, especially Isaac, when he's like, it's too hard. I, I keep saying to him, that moment of mental discomfort when you're struggling and you want to quit, it's when you push through that, that's when you, you grow and you actually get somewhere. But I think people are so used to just, oh, click. I didn't, I'm all done with that. Click, move on. So I do think there's something to be said for what you were saying, Francis, about having to like go to libraries and, and not being able to afford to just order them on Amazon and have them show up at your doorstep and, and having to actively take a hand in crafting your own education. Yeah, a, a thousand, a thousand, a thousand percent. I, I agree. Like this was, this is often actually a discussion uh, in the studio now and when I was at Raid. Um, not so much in Top Cow because we were young and dumb back then. But you know what it is? I like you said, it's it's the grit. And oftentimes I find that everything is snap of a finger, right? Like back in the days of like, oh, who was that guy in that movie? You know, like you, yeah. you really got to think and then maybe you got to do a little research. Now, just, just look at my phone real quick. And there's this sense of instant gratification. Mm -hmm. And yeah. through that instant gratification, you're not learning the process, right? It's, it's like, you know, a, a guy that knows how to fix his car internally will probably drive better than somebody who just, you know, presses the pedal and, and goes, right? Yeah. And with artwork and, and, and writing and, and coloring and every aspect of, of the discipline, right? We can show you how to do it and you will understand it from a, an aesthetic standpoint and from a physical standpoint of physically doing it. But it takes a while for your, your I guess what, cognitive reasoning to fully adapt it as part of, of your muscle memory, right? Because muscle memory has a sense of, of, un, of a deeper understanding that's deeper than the surface, right? And when you see somebody do it and you copy it, right? It's, it's not the same as you going through the, the difficult process because oftentimes uh, whenever I feel like oh, everything I'm drawing looks, looks terrible, something's wrong. And it took me a long time to realize that those are the periods of growth because some people will quit because they're like, ah, this is terrible. I, I give up. Right. But the thing is, is that the reason why you're struggling is because your brain is analyzing that something is wrong. And to understand that something is wrong, 
you had to have had the the the, the journey to get there, right? Yes. And then yes. it's the figuring out how to fix it part, right? That's that's the hard part because once you fix it, you feel great again on top of the world. Then the process happens right. again. Yeah. Go, he goes through that. I see you go through that all the time. I actually, and it's funny you're talking about that muscle memory that takes a deeper level. And then I think you're finding it in some of your videos, having to pull yourself out of the muscle memory and then retrack and explain and and break something down that you now just intuitively understand mm -hmm. how you. You know, it's it's a very out. different thing. Yeah, it really is. Yeah, it's it's for sure. Do you find you something that I completely forgot? You just were mesmerized <laughs> by Francis. It really was. I think you know what though, Francis. It was such a great answer, and halfway through it, I, I had this point that I wanted to make, and you know what? Uh, you made my point. So. <laughs> no, but but you know what? And I bet you go through this all the time. And I bet you you go through it when you're editing your videos, as you're watching yourself draw. It's 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 very you feel self conscious, but at the same time, when you're when you're forced to talk about your process, sometimes you unearth something that you didn't even know you were doing, but you were doing it already. And what Absolutely. happens is that the next time this this thing that you were doing instinctively, now you can harness it and use it whenever you want, right? Which is the interesting thing. So like I find that that talking about my art. And, and you talking about your art, I feel like we get as much out of it as other people because we're being forced to analyze ourselves. And then through the, because oftentimes there's things that I do that I, I, I didn't know I was doing until a question is asked. And I'm like, oh, well, I think I did it because of this. And then the next time it's not an accident. Now you're doing it on purpose, you know, and it's, yeah. it's all a facade. It's, <laughs> it's, it's it's fake until we realize. Don't it's look fake. behind the curtain. <laughs> well, that's yeah. the thing about art is uh, there are no real answers. Yeah. And so any way you approach it is, is just as valid as any other if it works. And that can be very daunting trying to explain something, trying to find you know what is really the best way to explain it. There. Yeah, so, but I I have learned so much just over the last few months, and I feel like it is making me better and and more confident after. You know, 27 years for me of doing this, it's been a great thing for me. I feel like watching your stuff, I, it's it's interesting because it almost feels like you're rediscovering a, a passion, you know, because at, at, at this point, you know, I, I feel like you've drawn everything under the sun and it seems like the irony of you almost treading an old path, it's almost like you're discovering different paths. It's like redoing a level of, of a video game and realizing there was like another path that you could have taken. So it's, yeah. it's very, I just find it very interesting. I just find it very interesting watching you do your, your tutorials because I, I, you know, being an artist as well, as well, obviously like you, I'm obviously projecting a bit maybe because I, I, I don't know. It's just a feeling that I'm getting when I'm, when I'm watching your stuff that like, Oh man, you know, this is, did he always do that? Or did he like, you know what I mean? It's uh... yeah. There are times. There are a lot of things that I always did, and yeah. I, I think I understood. You know, and then there are other times where I feel like I'm completely rudderless on a video. You know, there are so many sections that I end up cutting where I just I draw myself into a dead end. And I'm like, okay, wow, this totally didn't work. But I'm I'm really I'm learning so much by doing it. I almost I wish I had endless time on YouTube to put that stuff up just so I could yeah. say, you know, here's what it looks like to try something and have it not work you still learn something from that absolutely like i i i think i echo a lot of what your fans are saying which is i want to see you paint <laughs> <laughs> well and i've been watching some of the you, know, you you have a, a youtube channel you have a huge yeah. huge instagram following but i don't think many people know about your youtube channel yet uh the stuff that you have up there first of all the production quality is incredible amazing and you're a great presenter amazing. But just Thank watching you. the work, like a, there's a flash painting, um, the uh, uh, Hellboy painting, it's it's incredible watching the process. I, I feel like I've been learning a lot from it. It's made me want to try painting. When somebody makes it look easy, you want to try it, you know? Everything so. looks easy when you uh, double the speed. Like <laughs> <laughs> There you go. That's yeah. the secret. Oh, by the way... Uh, thank you for for the shout out on your channel because you know I'm I'm very I upload very infrequently and um, 
I remember like a month or so ago, I'm like, I, I don't check very often. I'm like, what's all these spikes coming from? And I realized it happened on a Monday. I'm like, oh, wait a second. That's when Dave does his Monday drawing. I, I feel like. Oh, it's great. Yeah. yeah. So I was like, oh, whoa, this is, this is cool. You know, like, you know, your, uh, your massive amount of followers just uh, trickled on my channel. But, uh, and it's funny because like, um, I would say that like, what we do is the same, but, but pretty different, you know, it's interesting because there's the things that I think there's like different levels of watching and I'm sure you do this too. Like, let's say, you know, I, I had to learn how to fix my dishwasher and when I'm YouTubing, trying to figure out how to, how to do it, I want to get straight to the facts, right? Yeah. yeah. That's, that's how yeah. I watch YouTube. Where's yeah. the part that I need? Right. right. And, it, and it's the same thing as like when I'm buying something, okay, just, just, just tell me if this is any good. Right. And I think that the way you do it, you actually get so detailed into it that it, it feels like I'm in, in a master class, you know, which is incredible, right? Because there's so much information, right? And so there's, there's, there's chunks, right? So there's the give me quick two minute info. There's the master class style. And then I, I'm kind of trying to do this third thing, which is when I was, whenever I research products and a lot of it is, um, I've, I've always been a fan of, of photography. Yep. And, uh, I had a camera that I bought over 10 years ago. And it's funny, as I'm looking through my hard drive, I realized I, I had bought this, this Canon T2i. Um, it was one of the first Canons that were affordable to the consumer that could do video. So I, I didn't realize, I didn't even know what vlogging was. Cause I remember at the time my, my, my ex was like doing these videos. I'm like, well, that's stupid. You know, and now I feel, <laughs> I feel so dumb. Right. And then I see all these old videos of myself on it. Like, uh, well, I guess I'll show you my apartment. You know, I don't know what to do with this thing. And I remember when I got a GoPro, I would, I strapped it to my dog. I didn't know what to do with it. I, I didn't connect comics and cameras, right? Yeah. So I, I, I fell out of the hobby because at, at the time, what I was interested in was taking photos of, of architecture. That was my, I guess, therapy, you know, taking pictures of buildings, right? And I just fell out of the hobby because, you know, it's taking photos is, and, and walking around. It's such a time consuming, but also very like nice meditative, meditative thing to, to do. It's mm -hmm. a luxury not afforded to the parents of small children. Exactly, exactly, right? But I, I realized that with, with comics, I, I needed, I was getting a little bit burnt out a, a few years ago, and I just needed a, a different outlet for, that was creative, something that wasn't for anybody, that was just for myself, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I bought this this camera, and um, that's why there's a camera there. Um, so I bought this, this camera and I was just taking photos and I'm like, oh, this, this takes videos, right? I'll, I'll, I'll take some time lapse of things. And when I was watching reviews of cameras, I realized that there, you know, roundabout way of answering the question, there were some reviews that just said, oh, this camera's great, right? And there were some reviews where this camera's great, but hang on, I'm going to go get a smoothie or, 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 or something like that, right? Like there was a, there was a story that was happening and it just so happened that that camera was along for the ride. Right. And it made me realize, wait a second. Like I always thought YouTube was for people like, Oh, I'm unboxing something. Look at this thing that I bought or, or, or this or that. It never occurred to me that it was just as viable of a platform to tell a story. Right. So whenever I saw these guys who would review an item, but really, the item was was almost the MacGuffin in this 10 minute story that they're telling, right? So at, at the beginning of, of the, the YouTube video, you know, they, they set off and, and set up the premise of what they're doing. And then the ones who go through it and complete it, there's this weird subconscious sense of, of completion in the story. And I was like, whoa, did this guy just make like a 10 minute movie reviewing a camera? Yeah. And you yeah. watch the whole thing and yeah. Yeah, watch the whole thing. And There's then an intimacy I, there too, I think, that happens. It becomes a bit of a voyeuristic experience in a way that a simple unboxing video isn't. 
Absolutely. Right? Like it's, it's, you're, it's, you're, it's the reason why reality shows are so popular on TV. It's because you're, you're seeing another person's, I mean, it's crafted, curated reality, obviously. Yeah. But in those videos, they're taking you in a life story, basically. Absolutely. And, and I think what's interesting is some of the, the other YouTubers who transcended beyond the product that they're reviewing where, you know, I don't care about this, but I'll watch it because I think they're entertaining or they craft a good video. They edit real well. They tell a good story. Like it's, and it also kind of made me realize that this is the way sounds so old. This is the way young people consume stories. <laughs> man, right? Oh my gosh. <laughs> Francis, you're young people. I always think of you as your young people. Do you know what I mean? We're like the old fogies. I'm like, oh, there's Francis. He's so young. I mean, you're not like significantly you younger than Dave, but you still, I know. Little gray. I, yeah. Yeah. I, can't, I got keep my hair blonde so you can't see the gray. I think yeah. I'm I'm the youngest one here because I've got no gray. Oh, is so. that what that yeah, is? That's our <laughs> like yeah, it, yeah. I don't know, man. Like I, I just I just found it fascinating because I realized that one of the reasons uh, I I'm sorry, Meredith, if I'm jumping questions. One of the reasons why I started writing is because I, I just wanted, I wanted it to be more reflective of who I am, right? And one of the reasons why I suck at uploading these videos is that I actually have, I, I've filled up already like a five terabyte hard drive of videos that I am painstakingly editing because it's like that page that you keep redrawing, right? So I have these, these videos on, on certain topics, but my goal with it is to edit the videos and film it in a way that is reflective of the theme of what I'm showing, right? Yeah. So if I, you know, I have like this video that I've been editing on on pacing uh, for storytelling of comic books, and almost all the footage from it is from New York Comic Con in 2019, and but I'm editing editing it in the way that, you know, the way you explain the metronome of comics, the rhythm of it, right? So right. I'm trying to edit the video that as you're watching it, you're subconsciously seeing what I'm talking about, even if I don't have to draw it for you, you know, like the way you're experiencing the video, you know what I mean? And it's, it's really difficult because I think I'm biting off more than I can chew because uh, I, you know, it's so I, funny. I love what you're saying. And yet I feel like I had this exact same conversation with Dave this morning mm -hmm. where, you know, when you talk to new artists and they're like, you can never let it go a, a page go because it's not perfect. Mm -hmm. And Dave finds that with videos he's doing, he's like, he has a hard time letting it go because it's not perfect. And it sounds like for you with your own videos, you're feeling a little bit of that, like I have an idea yeah. in my head of what it's gonna be, but sometimes you just have to set yourself a deadline, Francis. I, at the but same time though. Just, yeah, I mean, it sounds, that being said, I gotta be honest, your videos have such a, a level of perfectionism and artistry behind them that I totally understand. Yeah, they're just entertaining yeah, to watching they're, themselves. They're and it's like a, for me, it's it's very interesting. And this is actually a question that I wanted to talk to you about. And I I have to say, I really wasn't sure how to approach it because I know how to do storytelling, but I'm not creative with my storytelling. It's very much a it's it's like a workhorse for me. You know, I, I have my establishing shot and I, I do my shots and I try to make sure that it flows and it has a flow down the page and it's, you know, competent. But with your storytelling uh, over the years, it's developed into something that is really much more involved and beyond my understanding. And so it's really interesting to hear you talk about your YouTube videos in a similar way, because, you know, again, with my YouTube videos, there is none of that. It's just outside of my skill set. But that's the thing, though, right, is that there's a there's a shoe for everyone's foot, you know, and I think that if, if I were learning and trying to become a comic book artist, your channel is much more valuable than mine. You know, like these are one of the reasons why my channel will never be successful is because I, I am making them almost for me because I'm not super naive in that. Here's the thing, like if I were to make it completely for me, it actually probably wouldn't even be tutorials or comic books. Um, what I did be, before I put out my first YouTube video, I, I actually started 
learning how to edit on Adobe Premiere, editing family gatherings and vacations and stuff. So I would, I would find a music that I, that I liked and I would try to make like a, a, a crappy music video of all these clips and try to make everything feel like a story within this thing. Um, actually, uh, my, my partner, Rachel, her birthday was in, in January, uh, on, on the fourth. And because of COVID, it's hard to get out. And we kind of said, you know, let's, let's tone down on, on birthday presents. So what I did was I made her a, a, a video, right? So I, I like stayed up all night editing it. And then I, I snuck it onto her hard drive. Cause she's, Aww. she's a terrible movie pirater, even though we have every <laughs> streaming uh, <laughs> service you can think of, she still likes pirating stuff. So I, I snuck it onto her hard drive. And I put it on TV where it always is. And I attached a balloon to the hard drive and said, you know, happy Aww. birthday. And I, you know, like, I, I really enjoy those things because to me with these videos, it's like there are certain parameters and limitations that of, of storytelling that we can't quite access sometimes with comic books. Uh, there are certain things that we can do in comic books that, that no other medium can do. And... I feel like when I was on the flash, I wanted to exploit every aspect of that. And I remember when they're like, Oh yeah, we're going to do digital as well. I remember thinking, huh, how do I make the guy who's making this thing digital's job as hard as possible <laughs> and make people need to have the physical comic book. Right. And that's why there were so many dull page spreads because spreads don't quite work digitally, especially when the panels are all janky and stuff. Right. Uh, that's, that is yeah. true. Yeah. yeah. That is and, true. and with, with videos, I, I realized it's it's fun to me it's fun like editing is fun i know that editing is like the boring part but that's where like the story comes alive and then once you put in the music it's it's such a, an overall experience for the the audience or the viewer or whoever's watching it that it feels like whoa i can control every part of their senses except for the smell right and like the right music, the right edit, the right cut. I was just like, oh, I, I'm, I don't know, man. Like I could talk You're about a it all day. You're a filmmaker at heart. You're a filmmaker. Well, yeah. I mean, I don't know. It to me, the thing is, is that I remember working in on this television show years ago, and you know, it wasn't behind the camera; it was in front of it. Was but it, was it Beast? Beast something? Yeah, was yeah. That's Beast Legends. It was Beast Legends. terrible, but I had so much fun. And like one of my favorite moments were you know when you're traveling with a crew you get really close right and 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 there's what they show of you on camera and then there's who you are and what you like right. and i found myself chatting with the director and and the and the director of photography all the time and one of my favorite things was was near the end they're like oh because you know it was like these big art projects they're like how do you imagine shooting this and like I had so much fun, like, just, oh, yeah, maybe if we place the camera over here and we do this, and they're like, well, that's a great idea. And I'm just like, ha ha, sucker. We do that all the time in comic books. Like, they're angled <laughs> it's so funny. all the time. Because you, yeah. Dave is always saying in comics, you're the director. Mm -hmm. The director of the movie. Mm -hmm. So I think that makes sense then that you would find editing and, and directing all of that part of your comfort zone and your niche and, and so on. I feel like we should ask about what you're doing now. <laughs> Or do you have another question? I do. And actually this one for me was the most important one. So before we oh. go on to, uh, yeah. you started working digitally quite a while ago now. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the texturing and the approach that you, uh, that you use, I feel like you really pioneered and I'm seeing it in, in artists like uh, Juan Jimenez, who I think is incredible. Yeah. And quite a few he others. Uh, now, and I, I don't do it, so my understanding of it isn't really probably where it should be, but I don't know of another artist that was doing it before you. And uh, is that the case? Is it something that you saw somebody else doing or is it just experimentation or how did that come about? Um, first, thanks, man. That's, that's high praise. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, I, actually, it's funny. Um, I remember at a DC summit, you had like this this tablet that you were lugging around and you were drawing and I'm like, oh, what is that, Dave? And you're like, oh, it's this, this program, I'm drawing on it. And I remember seeing Dale Keown as well with, with, with I, I forget what it was, but it wasn't like a antique, it was- It was actually just like a portable 
Oh, Samsung. That Samsung's, little Samsung. Yeah, thing. yeah. It, 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 was, it was weird. It was, I, and, and I was just like, "Whoa, that's that's really cool." Dave can work right now and ignore this meeting. That that's amazing. You know? <laughs> and so the main reason, actually, I I, I was going to make a a video on why I went dig, from traditional to digital, but I'll spoil it here. But, <laughs> but like, first it was like. Um, the just the the fascination of it you know um initially i just did layouts I, I dipped my feet in very slowly first it was just the thumbnails and then i would literally print out the entire 20 page comic book on 11 by 17 i'd slap it on my board and then i'd put a comic book in uh, a comic board and i would draw it right and as i got more confident with it it went from a thumbnail to roughs that i would then light box then from roughs to pencils that I would then print out in ink right over but the main reason why I switched, I would say, was just before my daughter was born, uh, which was, she's four years old, but about five years ago, I started shifting because one of the things that I was doing um, with with ink wash and, and things like that, it was very difficult to travel with it, right? So when I would switch from working in the studio to, to going home, it was difficult to haul all that stuff. And I remember I had this one nightmare moment where I had literally drawn eight pages of the flash and I put it in my backpack and I was going to bring it home. And I was so tired. I put it down on, on the sidewalk and then I hopped in the car and drove away. Right. And I freaked out. And when I came back, my bag was gone. I'm like, Oh my God, I, I didn't care about the artwork. I was just more, I can't believe I'm going to have to redraw these eight pages. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And a block away as I was looking around, my bag was gone, but in the bus shelter, I guess they just wanted the bag and they threw out all my artwork, right? So I, I grabbed it, I'm just like, oh my God, right? Oh my gosh, if only they'd known the value of what they threw in the bus shelter. <laughs> no kidding, especially since I don't sell any of my flash artwork, you know, which is pretty hilarious. Uh, so th that was one moment, uh, and it was an accumulation of everything, right? And I realized that with things like Dropbox and external hard drives, I would set up, it's actually what I have now. I have a, a, a computer set up at the studio and have a computer set up at home. So as soon as I hit save, Dropbox updates, and then when I go home, I can pick up where I left off. There's no weird sense of rhythm because with ink wash and the way watercolor dries or when you want it, when it's most active, when it's wet, I, f I found that I was staying later and later in the studio. Whereas, you know, basically it's like, hey, what time are you gonna come home? I don't know, whenever this page is finished, right? Because, you know, it's it's wet on wet medium. You know, I, I can't go now, I, I gotta go while it's wet, you know? Or oh, I'm sitting here cause I'm waiting for it to dry, you know? And it's, I found that my life ended up having to work around the schedule of when these pages would be done. So sometimes, I might go home at six. Sometimes I might go home at 11 PM. It, it, it always changed. Right. But with, with digital, I found it much easier to remain on a strict nine to five or 10 to six schedule. Right. And then if I get a little bit of work done, uh, when the kids asleep at around 10, great, you know, I'll putz around a little bit on the computer cause the files there and ready to go. So, you know, one, one of the main reasons was portability and the time it was allowing me with with my family was something that I couldn't replace, you know, like much to the chagrin of my art dealer, Quan Chang, yeah. uh, quanchangart.com. Uh, <laughs> shout out. Shout out. And Quan is a great guy too. He's yes. just in general a good person. Yeah, he's, he's fantastic. And we, we always joke around that, you know, it's, you know what I mean? It's, I am, because sometimes he'll be like, hey man, I sold this thing for that much. And I'm just like, oh my God, you know, maybe I should rethink this thing, right? But oftentimes when I come into the studio, so for instance, I remember a few months ago, the, the last cover of Batman Beyond, I was like, oh, you know what? Maybe I'll do this thing traditional so that Quan can sell it, you know? Good, good amount of money, right? And at that point in time, the way I work when I work traditional is, you know, I'll, I'll pencil it and I'll ink it, but I always find that penciling and, and inking 
that takes most of the day and it might spill over into the next day, right? So let's say yeah. day one, I'm, I'm penciling it and inking it. Day two, I'm finishing the inks and laying down flats and colors. And then day three, I'm refining it. So it's now a three day process, right? Yeah. But yeah. I remember I knew that I didn't have a lot of time because I, I, I don't remember what we were doing, but there was some, some family obligations that we had and I only had one day and I'm just like, ah, you know what, screw this, man. It was, it was like 11 a.m. at the studio and I was swimming in high and I just started the cover. And by the time it was 7.30 p.m., I was finished penciling, inking, and coloring it. I, I handed it off the next day. So, so what you're saying is it's significantly faster. It's significantly faster for me because I, I kind of adjust the way that I draw when I'm working digitally, right? Because it's, it's one of the things that I learned when I started inking myself is that I'm not a very good inker. I don't have the same control as, as professional inkers, right? My inking is very sloppy. And I found that I really struggled when I tried to ink my tight pencil work. So I had to just draw with the inks. And the initial phase of working digital was a little bit tough at first because I was trying to recreate my traditional work. And I realized mm. how inefficient that was because I wasn't taking full advantage of what I can, what I could do. Right. So when I started working digital, I realized I don't have to think of it as steps. I, I, I could think of it as, as a whole. Right. right. So I could be flatting as I'm penciling, you know what I mean? I could be coming up with a color theory as I'm, I'm thumbnailing. So by the time the execution is happening, it's like, you've already, it's like somebody, um, it was, it feels like a, a meal prep and you're just throwing it all together and, and cooking it. It's also making me adjust what I want to do with my art because I'm becoming obsessed with like simplicity and, and stuff that's more graphic. Mm -hmm. I know that it's, it's, it's a bit of a struggle because like, you know, when I started working on justice league, I felt like, ah, oh, you know, I, I can't do that kind of stuff. You know, I gotta, I gotta draw like a cool guy, you know, I gotta put some of this in and put some of this detail in. Right. And it's, and it's, I like it. I, I think for the craftsmanship, I really enjoy doing that as well, but it, it doesn't give me the same, uh, I guess, sense of satisfaction as like, Oh, that one, I drew that with only five lines and it looks way better than the one that it took me like, 500 lines, you know, and it, it's, it's still a work in progress. And it, yeah, I don't know, man, like, like, like digital has just changed everything. You know, I, I feel like it's, it's made me, I think a better home partner to me, a better parent. It's made me somebody that is more, uh, there, but that said though, like there is a caveat to that because a few times when we went to the cottage, I brought my computer and I worked there because I, I He's almost yeah. like he could read my mind. Can you could read my mind as a spouse going yeah. more time with the family, more productive, more, but. Well, the thing is, is that, so I, I started doing the math. Like, I mean, this is, is going to be pretty informative for, for your audience. So I remember a long time ago, I was, I was talking to an artist friend of mine and, you know, he was, I won't name names, but he's an amazing draftsman and, you know, he was one of those guys when we were in the studio, they're like, oh, he's, he's the, he's the chosen one. You know, he's <laughs> the one. Right. And, and he was the Michael uh, Turner of Dave's day. Yeah. Yeah. And it was interesting because he, he fell in love with that convention money, you know? Mm -hmm. And next thing I knew, I'm like, Hey man, what book are you working on? He's like, I'm just doing cover. I, I, I don't know. I, he's like, I can make more in, in three days than I would like in a month, you know, I'm just like, sure. you know, and then he would tell me like how much he would make. I would just fall off my chair. Like, oh my God, that's, that's incredible. You know, but you're traveling all the time. You're like a traveling circus, you know? Yeah. And so he's like, Oh, you should do this too. I'm like, well, I don't know, man. Like, you know, when I started at DC and I, got on books that sold well. It's like, oh, these royalties are pretty good, right? Yep. And when I started doing the math, I'm like, wait a second, you know, one page, if I keep doing them, accumulates to one comic. One comic, if I keep doing more, accumulates to trade paperbacks. Trade paperbacks, when I do more, accumulates to volumes, you know, and then these volumes 
do really well in terms of um, royalties, right? And I found that doing that also made me hireable, right? Yes. And in the long term, when I started doing the math, well, I could make more by doing less and I would be showing my artwork to infinitely more people than yeah. one guy buying one piece of art. Yeah, right? absolutely. And that was a real wake up moment for me because if I just do what we all came in here to do initially, which is we want to draw comic books, we want to tell stories and we stick to that. The, the medium, whether somebody's like, oh man, if you did this thing traditionally, I would have bought it for X amount or this amount. And, and sometimes, sure, it, it breaks my heart a little bit, but at the same time, it's like, well, you know, that day I got to hang out at home and, and, and watch my kid ride her bike at like yeah. 5.30 yeah. PM yeah. or, yeah. or two months from now, there was a royalty check that came in and I didn't have to work. You didn't have to do anything, you didn't have to do anything right? You didn't have to spend three days on something that could really be done in a day, a day and a half, right? So. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry these answers are so long. So Don't good. apologize for your answers because they're super informative. Yeah, absolutely. And that's actually, honestly, Francis, this kind of conversation is the reason we wanted to do this in the first place. To, yeah. It's a conversation amongst peers, right? Like, it's different yeah. from me speaking with somebody who is just interviewing me for their podcast because they don't necessarily know what I'm doing or, or what it's like in the industry. So I think this is very helpful. And at this point now, I, yeah, we didn't even get into the writing. I know that's, I, this is what I was just going to say in maybe six months. We need to just have you back. That's we need to all. do this again. We'll just get, we'll come to have you back for like Meredith and Francis talk writing, but yeah, cause it's been yeah, so, I'm, I'm so much fun to just talk about this. Now I do want to talk quickly about what you've been working on recently. Cause you've done some death metal stuff. Mm -hmm with Scott Snyder for DC. Um, I know you did a cover for, uh, it's Nocturna, I think. Yeah, no, Nocturna. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Um, Tony Daniel. And Tony Daniel, yep. So what else, what else are you working on right now? Are you doing, are you jumping on the Kickstarter bandwagon and doing your own book or the Indiegogo thing? What's Francis um, doing now? Yeah, uh, well, it was- Besides so waiting for the baby. Besides waiting for the baby, yeah. I, it was sort of announced. Uh, I'm doing a, I'm working on a creator own book with with Scott Snyder. Um, I don't want to say more because there is going to be a new player in the game of comics. That I mean, I think if we do Kickstarter, it would be more for like behind the scenes stuff. But um, we we have a digital and print publisher. Um, one of whom is established in the comic book game and one of whom is looking to establish themselves in the comic book game. Um, and myself and Scott uh, and other projects from Black uh, Jacket uh, are going to be released through this, this thing. Sure. Uh, uh, aside from that, I, I worked on like video game stuff. I, I've been working on a lot of you stuff. Did, that like I a big Xbox thing. Yeah. Or, what is it? I'm not. I'm not the video game person. Xbox the, F. The Xbox. Series X. Yeah. 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 Were you? Yeah, yeah. Display in Toronto and over the water. Yeah. It was yeah, that was that was so cool. I was that was um, a super super proud moment, especially since it's it's my hometown. You know, it's because. Yeah. Um, do you ever get this sometimes, Dave, where it's like, man, sometimes when I travel to a convention not in my hometown, it seems like people like me here more than my own hometown, right? Like <laughs> We don't do conventions in Windsor anymore because we're like, no one's gonna who's gonna show up our moms? Pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> Mom will come. We're old, we're an old hat in our in our own city. That's and right. I, I liked it because that wasn't the comic book fan base. It, it was just the man or woman on the street that would see this or, or video game fans. And, and it was kind of a, a great way to also establish our studio as our first studio project uh, together. Cause we, we work all separately, right? Like my, my other studio mates, by the way, is a uh, tribe Wong. He does his book called Oscar Zahn uh, on webtoons. 
and uh, Dylan Burnett, who worked on a bunch of stuff with Donny Cates over at Marvel, and he has a, a brand new creator on book as well with Donny Cates. Uh, so in 2021, I would say the entirety of the studio is basically focusing on creator own work, which is amazing because when I was in the last studio, we were all like freelancers, you know, working for other people. So it's kind of exciting to be in this different arena and you know, it's, it's hard to do that now because of COVID, but before all the lockdowns, shooting the shit, we would come up with new ideas. So, and it would be so exciting that we, we got like these cork boards in the main kitchen dining room of the studio. And we started pinning ideas that as a studio, we might try to, to uh, execute almost like an animation studio. Yeah. style to produce a comic book not, not for any purpose other than our own uh i guess because yeah. we can you know but uh but yeah so right now uh uh brand new creator on book from me and scott snyder uh untitled unannounced uh and unannounced. that'll be out in 2021 like can people look for it in this year or do you think next year I, realistically I, so. I i i'd like to think by the fall of 2021 i think we'll be announcing soon ish um and then aside from that like this is the first time i've like not been exclusive i've been exclusive with dc for over 10 years yeah. and you know when it was time to renew the contract i i really felt like you know these these are like real conversations right so so when i renewed my last contract uh, three years ago, um, I had just bought a house. I had just had a kid. Uh, and I was like, yeah, this is a good offer. I want to, I want to be stable. Right. And yep. I kind of felt a little bit like, I felt like I stopped taking risks in my career in the last five years, you know, because, you know, it's, it's different when you become a parent, right? Because yep. Before, you know, when I was on The Flash, I'm like, oh, it's my favorite character. I'm like, oh, it's, it's time to go. You know, it's just time to go. And then when I was on Detective, it wasn't even a year. And I'm like, oh, it's also time to go. And I always felt like it was a mistake, but I always found that it's it's exciting to take a risk because I find that it rejuvenates my my excitement for what I'm working on. I think and you, and, you and Dave are very similar in that sense. And I remember when he left DC, and I mm -hmm. suspect that you felt in a similar way that he was like, if I don't take a risk on myself and believe in myself at some yeah. point, who will? Absolutely. Just to bring it back to the basketball analogy, when the Raptors won, one of the players, Fred Van Fleet, undrafted, his slogan on his shirts was bet on myself. Yep. And I was like, man, you know, why don't I do that? Right. And I, I've loved DC. They've, They've literally bought me my house. You know, they, they've bought me uh, a stable and comfortable life, but it feels, I don't want to say short sighted because it was at the right time, it was at the right time in the right place. Right. But I, I would say that I probably stayed much longer than I had intended to. And I felt like I had all these creator own ideas that fizzled out because of work that was, that was coming in, you know, it, it, it was difficult to turn stuff down. Like they like, Oh, what about justice league? What about this? Right. So it wasn't like, Oh, poor me. You know, like, it's like, Oh, here, why don't the things they were offering me were things that I wanted to do. Right. And I, and I think they were probably doing that. So I, I would. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh, absolutely. yeah absolutely. He still struggles with that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't think they wanted you to go anywhere. Yeah. Yeah, and 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 it's I think this is this is the first time I've had to say no a bunch of times. And it, and I felt bad. I don't know if if you feel that way, but like it, it almost he feels say like, no. He still can't say no. Yeah, it's like somebody's asking you out on a date and you're like, "I I should give him a shot." You know? Like yeah. constantly. Yes. I'm like, yes, "Why? Why did you say yes to this? You already have too much to do." <laughs> Yeah. So, so, I, you know, once, 
I, and, and I had to set up a rule for myself where I literally said, hey, this is the last thing I'm going to say yes to. And that one was easy because it was Superman and Mark Wade. And then after that, it was with Jeff Johns and, and Scott Snyder. And it was all short stories. Yeah. And I was like, oh, those are easy yeses. But the, the other ones that I wasn't emotionally tied to, it was funny because it was technically on paper easy to say no to. But as a longtime DC guy, it... it, it I felt like I was letting my coach down or it's yeah. like, oh, sorry, coach. I, I don't feel like yep. playing today. Yeah. You know? Yeah. You, you end up with a, such a relationship with your editor and with all the people yeah. there. It's like a family, uh, you know, yeah. even though I see my conventions, but yeah, it's amazing how close you can get. All right. We, we could talk to Francis all day long. Like, yeah. We, and we, I, could, we could talk, we could do this all day long. I think what that means is we just have to have you back. And especially, yeah, I'd love to see you, uh, an interview more focusing on writing, which means that I'll be sitting here watching, but that's all right. Gladly. And I, 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 I think this is like a super Canadian thing in the same way that we feel bad when we say no to things. I, I feel like I'm going to apologize again. Cause I, 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 I... <laughs> look, man, I, I've been up since 2am and I, this is talking about this stuff is it's, it's an escape for us, you know? And I feel like I'm, I'm blabbing a lot and I'm, kind of leapfrogging questions that were coming, but it's, everything is so connected that it's hard to parcel everything. It, makes, it right? just makes sense. And yeah. that's why it is just a conversation. Like I, we yeah. have questions because, you know, that's, we should have questions in case we need to ask a question. But the point of this is to have the conversation and to give people, you know, insight into what it's yeah. like. So. Don't you like, apologize. Don't questions. you be so Canadian. I have questions. Like, I, I want to know. I want to know things, you know? Like, yeah. like why did you start a YouTube channel? Like, I always knew that you you loved teaching. And, and it's watching your growth, by the way. You know, it's there was... crazy. It was big. It's been crazy. And it's funny because there's only two guys on, on YouTube that, that focus on comic books. Um, uh, one of them is... Uh, he's a guy from, from, from South Africa. But... He, I remember seeing when he had 2,000 and then I, I like blinked my eye and he had like 200,000, you know, and I feel like the same thing with, with, with you. I'm like, you, your YouTube channel was dormant for a long time. Yeah. And, and then like, it seemed like you reached uh, a, a certain growth rate over the last three months. That's what I want to ask you about. I was like, hey, Dave, how do I make my channel good? <laughs> I really think, so I put up videos years and years ago and nobody watched them. Uh, it went nowhere. And I, but when he came back, he had 10,000 subscribers. And it just, over the years, people slowly, and because they were subscribed, when I put up a new video. Finally. Finally, more people watched it. And so it gave it a little, you know, momentum. And then being regular. Yeah. Now for my part, it's different because I am not a natural in front of the camera. Uh, it's it's very difficult for me. So I just entirely made it about tutorial and teaching and tried to focus on that. And, you know, so it's providing a, a service to a viewer. And I, I think that connected, you know, um, it's so much stronger when you can provide uh, a personality to a viewer, somebody that they can really latch onto and get to know and, and you know, That's get why invested we have in. Meredith as part of the Monday Night Draw. Yeah. <laughs> so, really, I think YouTube is a weird kind of a place just because you can put up the greatest videos in the world. And if people aren't aware of it, mm -hmm. uh, YouTube won't, they need to know that there's an audience and then they start to actually put it out. And so everybody sees it in their feed and that's how people find it. And until that happens, it just, it doesn't happen. And I think that with the kind of videos that you're doing, especially if they're, they're more consistent, I know that's, that's hard. We're all so busy, but yeah, no, I, I see your channel blowing up uh, much bigger than anything I could ever achieve. It's a different thing for me. I'm it's tutorials and it's, it's YouTube wasn't really the goal. I tell myself that it was, you know, but, <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I think it's it, it at first when a channel is just when there there just isn't an awareness of it. Mm -hmm. It's it's just a matter of, you know, getting a bit of momentum and then people catch on to it and it becomes yeah. a big thing. Well, it's fascinating because I, I, I find that the, the you part of YouTube is is really important because, I you know, as I watch all of these videos, I see the difference between 
somebody just straight up telling me a story where I am not involved. And like you said, Meredith, earlier, this sense of voyeurism or when, when you talk to the camera that brings in the viewer, yeah. the you part of YouTube, right? And and I realized that a successful ingredient seems to be that, that I want something from you, right? And if I watch your video and I get nothing from you, aside from you talking at me, yeah. I don't want to watch again, you know, and, and it's, it's this weird balance of giving somebody, uh, what's it called? Like value, even though it's free. Yeah. No, it's value. received value. Oh, it's their time, yeah. which has value yeah. to people. Exactly. Which is whether it's something that improves them or something that they learn. So I, I think that you've, it's, it's like you checked off one aspect of like, if you were like a, D and D character like the 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 tutorial part is like <laughs> max <the> right, 10, <laughs> you know, and, awesome. and I'm inching along at like two on each element, <laughs> you know. Well, I think I mean just with the quality of the videos, and you have television experience. Yeah. Uh, just your presence on camera is is so great that look, you know. If you ever, well, thank you, but look, if you ever want me to edit some of your videos, dude. Oh, because you have all the time, Francis. <laughs> But we have children. We two have children, and ours are older. I, we've but been where you are. So if you think you don't have time now, just you wait till that little baby comes. I know number two. That's that's going to be a, a a game changer. But you know what? It's this is fun. Like like to me, this 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 YouTube stuff. It's it's tapping into a different part of of our creativity, and I think what you do on your channel and what a lot of other comic book artists do. I think when you unveil uh, a behind the scenes of how things are done, people realize how much more difficult it is. Even though you're breaking down the mysticism, it's actually making it seem even more legendary than before. So I think, you know, doing great stuff, man. Well, really, thank you, Francis. I really appreciate it. And thank you so much for coming on and spending some time with us. I know on a, a really busy, hectic, stressful day for you. Yeah. So. And say hi to Rachel and good luck. Yeah. Thank you. Know, make sure you send, I feel like now I'm going to say, make sure you let us know when the baby comes because now we're invested. Anytime <laughs> now. It could be anytime. It could be, I should probably Just check Just put us on the text list. I'll, I'll, I'll YouTube it and that will be our next interview. And I'll come live from the birthing suite. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, nobody needs that. Nobody. That's Talk a different kind that. of YouTube video. I'm not sure I'm ready for that one. Not if you edit it properly. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah. yeah. It's all about the editing. A lot of blur and yeah. Everything's everything's usable. So uh, you can find Francis on Instagram. We'll have a link in the description below. Also on YouTube, a phenomenal YouTube channel that not enough people know about right now. So please check the description below for that as well. And thank you so much to Francis and Meredith for another, I think this is a phenomenal episode. I'm really, I'm really happy with this. Another we could awesome not have had a better episode, guest. Yeah. So yeah, thank you very much. No, and we'll see you guys in the next one. Thank you so much, Dave. Thanks so much, Meredith. It's, this was awesome.